Canada's immigration policies are pushing the country towards a crisis at breakneck speed. For many Canadians, this is a hard reality to accept, because throughout its entire 150-year history, Canada has been a nation of immigrants. First came the French, the English, the Scottish, and the Irish. In the 20th century, Canada saw new waves of immigrants from Italy, Greece, Poland, and Portugal. And in the past 50 years, Asia has become the primary source of migrants for Canada, with immigrants from China, India, Vietnam, and the Philippines being the largest groups coming to the country. For for generations, each of these groups and many others were able to build comfortable lives for themselves in Canada. Today, the country is a vast mosaic of ethnicities, cultures, and religions. And that's something Canadians are proud of, which is why it's taken many of them a long time to realize that the old reality of Canada as an immigrant nation is beginning to fall apart. And it's falling apart because Canada has lost its ability to absorb new migrants. The country is facing a massive housing crisis, made worse by a government that recently increased immigration levels, but refuses to take responsibility for crafting new housing policy. And I'll be blunt as well. Housing isn't a primary federal responsibility. Canada's healthcare system is under severe strain. Many of the people working in it are saying it's on the edge of falling apart, and it's being made worse by professional medical associations that keep the supply of doctors and nurses low, even as the country's population grows and grows. So why is Canada's once great society falling apart? And where is it headed now? In this video, we'll answer these questions. But before we do, be sure to subscribe to our channel to get notifications on all our latest news and analysis. And if you like this video, hit the like button and help us spread the word. For generations, Canada took in large amounts of immigrants among the highest levels of any developed country. That has led to big population growth. In the mid-1980s, Canada had 25 million people. This year, the country's population exceeded 40 million. For the most part, this rapid growth was never a problem. Canada is a vast country stretching across six time zones and the entire northern half of North America. There's plenty plenty of room. In fact, the distance between cities and towns in Canada are so huge that many in the country felt isolated from the rest of the world. As immigrants arrived and Canada's cities grew bigger, that sense of isolation began to recede. In Canada, maybe more so than in any other country, immigration was seen as a good thing. But today, people are beginning to question whether that's still the case, especially in light of Canada's liberal government, headed by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, which has repeatedly increased immigration levels to a point that it is now creating obvious crises, even though the government doesn't want to admit it. For many years, Canada had an immigration quota of around 250,000 people per year. Several years ago, the government increased that target to around 350,000 people per year. After the COVID pandemic ended, the government again increased immigration targets, this time to around 400,000 people per year. In 2023, that number is rising again to as many as 505,000 immigrants. And by 2025, Canada will be taking in around 550,000 migrants per year. But that's not all, because over the years, Canada has developed other ways for people to arrive. One is college and university students from abroad, hundreds of thousands of them per year. Canadian schools love foreign students because they pay higher tuition than local students. So international students have become a cash cow for universities, and every year, Canada's schools depend more and more on the money they bring in. Another way of getting into Canada is through the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. This was set up to help businesses that are facing labor shortages. But critics say that in effect, it's suppressing the wages of Canadians. Businesses that are having a hard time finding workers never have to raise wages. They can always bring in foreigners from poorer countries who are willing to work for less money than Canadians. Over the years, this has had a negative impact on Canadians' earnings. A generation ago, Canadians earned roughly what Americans earned. Today, that average Canadian earns about 23% less than the average American. The average wage in Canada is 44,000 US dollars compared to $57,000 in America. The temporary foreign worker program isn't the only reason Canadians' earnings are falling behind Americans, but it's a major one. Between the foreign worker program, the international students, and the immigration system, Canada's population increased by 1.2 million people in just the last year. That's a huge number for a country of 40 million people. 
But here's the thing, Canada can't handle this level of population growth. One example of the problem is the country's universal healthcare system. During the pandemic, many healthcare workers left the profession due to stress or sometimes due to the vaccine mandates that the provincial governments put in place in the health systems across the country. Many emergency rooms no longer have the staff to operate 24-7, and some are closing their doors on weekends. Patients with life-threatening illnesses have to wait months for treatment. Doctors and nurses themselves are saying the system is on the verge of collapse. You'd think all those immigrants would mean Canada could find replacements for those doctors who left, but no. Canada doesn't recognize the medical credentials of most of the countries it takes immigrants from. And this is intentional. The country has powerful professional organizations, like the Canadian Medical Association, which limit the number of doctors that are able to graduate from schools. And they ensure that doctors trained in other countries can't work in Canada. By doing this, they are creating an artificial shortage shortage, which ensures that wages of doctors stay high. Even as the temporary foreign worker program pushes down the wages of ordinary Canadians, doctors are acting as gatekeepers, keeping their own wages high. And in doing so, they're literally endangering the lives of Canadians. And healthcare isn't the only thing being made worse by immigration. Last year, Canada built around 250,000 new homes, not nearly enough to house the 1.2 million people who came to the country over last year. And now, thanks to high interest rates, many developers are pulling back on construction. They can't afford the loans they would have to take on to build more units. So even though Canada's population growth is accelerating, home construction is slowing down. This year, Canada is set to start construction on just over 200,000 homes. The problem with this is obvious. The cost of housing is soaring. The average house price in Canada has doubled in the past decade, and in the fastest growing cities, Toronto and Vancouver, it has tripled in about 15 years. Canada's political leaders don't see the connection between immigration levels and housing, because it never used to be a problem. The reality is that, as a percentage of population, Canada has had immigration levels this high before. It happened briefly in the 1940s, 1950s, and 1970s. But here's the thing. Canada was a very different country back then. Until the 1960s when it came to business, Canada was a hardcore capitalist and even libertarian country. You could build anything you wanted, basically anything anywhere you wanted. When Canada's population boomed in the 40s and 50s, developers were able to build vast tracts of housing on the edges of cities. Land was cheap, materials were cheap, and the blue-collar workers needed to build housing were everywhere. But since then, Canada has become much more restrictive about where and when housing can be built. Zoning laws were put into place that limited the height of buildings in many neighborhoods. The bureaucracy involved in building housing has grown and grown, and now the typical housing development needs to go through dozens of assessments and reviews before it's allowed to begin. And in recent years, Canadians have become opposed to urban sprawl. Most of Canada's major cities now have limits on how much cities can expand. Toronto, for instance, is ringed by a green belt where no development can take place. And despite the housing shortage, Canadians don't want further sprawl. When Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, recently allowed some development inside the green belt, it caused a massive backlash among voters. Simply put, Canadians want to have their cake and eat it too. But as house prices rise, growing numbers of people are being pushed out of housing altogether. Homeless camps are popping up all over the country, even in smaller cities that never had homelessness problems before. The city of London, Ontario now has a homeless encampment along the banks of its river, right next to downtown. In Toronto, homelessness used to be rare. Today, Allen Gardens, a beautiful botanical garden in the city center, has become one giant homeless camp. And even among those people who aren't yet homeless, the pressure is growing. Young people are unable to buy homes because of high prices, and lately, also because of high mortgage rates. Many households are now multi-generational, parents and adult children living together. Canadians once felt isolated in their vast country. Today, they're feeling increasingly crowded. So the question is, why is the government doing this? The answer lies with a think tank called the Century Initiative. Several years ago, the Century Initiative popped out of nowhere and began advocating a plan to grow Canada's population to 100 million people by the end of the 21st century. Their rationale for this policy is laid out on their website. The Century Initiative says, The world is changing at a rapid pace and Canada is falling behind. Our population is aging, we're having fewer children, and our workforce is shrinking. If we stay the course, Canada's annual GDP growth will decline, along with our influence on the world stage. Growing our population to 100 million by 2100 would reduce the burden on government 
revenues to fund health care, old age security, and other services. It would also mean more skilled workers, innovation, and dynamism in the Canadian economy. So who are these people that want Canada's population to explode? The Century Initiative is staffed by some of Canada's most prominent politicians, bankers, and business leaders. It's a cross-section of Canada's elite. There are people who will never have to worry about the cost of housing or the possibility that their children will become homeless. If they get sick, they can afford to go to a private hospital in the U.S. They don't have to wait months for treatment at Canada's overcrowded and understaffed hospitals. And there's a lot of overlap between the Century Initiative and Canada's Liberal government. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is carrying out the Century Initiative's goals. The Century Initiative is right about some things, but wrong in a major fundamental way. They are right that Canada can't afford its generous social safety programs. For decades, Canada has been deficit spending to cover the cost of its universal health care, retirement benefits, child support payments to parents, and so on. The gimmick has been to grow the population. This increases the tax revenue the government collects, making it possible to pay off the debt the country took on in previous years. But the problem with this gimmick is that it's an endless cycle. A larger population does allow the government to pay off old debts, but it also means higher health care costs, more retirement payments, and so on. So more new debt needs to be taken on. In other words, Canada has turned itself into a kind of Ponzi scheme, where today's population growth pays for yesterday's population, and tomorrow's population growth will have to pay for today's population growth. Sooner or later, a Ponzi scheme like this will have to collapse, but the Canadian government is pulling out all the stops to make sure the Ponzi scheme runs for as long as possible. Whether you look at it from the point of view of immigration or health care or the environment, what Canada is doing is unsustainable, and that which is unsustainable will eventually have to stop. Sooner or later, something in Canada is going to break, whether it's the country's immigration system or its health care or its generous social safety net or all of the above. Canada is running full speed toward a brick wall. If the country's political leadership doesn't change direction, it will hit that brick wall sooner or later. If you like this video, please hit the like button and help us spread the word. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel for notifications on our latest news and analysis. In the meantime, check out one of these videos here to learn more.